The military wives choirs perform a seasonal treat. But first, he's the man who gave us Michael Ball. Yes, and for that alone we must be eternally grateful. <laughs> but apart from that, he's also responsible for entertaining millions of audiences the world over with shows like this. Personified the benefits of risk taking. <laughs> I'm sitting opposite him. It's, I mean, Cameron McIntosh, this is your life, isn't it, really? Shows like oh, thank that. God, it still is. It still you know? is. Yeah. Astonishing. Was it always going to be musicals? I'm afraid it was. From, from my eighth birthday, where I was taken to see a wonderful musical called Salad Days. Um, Julian Slade. Uh, Julian Slade, and it opened just in nine, the early 50s. Uh, and it was the first British musical really to become one of the, became the one of the longest running musicals in its time. And it was all about a magic piano that made London dance. And I went in there thinking, oh, I won't like this. But of course, I loved it. And I, I worked out that the man, the young man playing the piano in the pit was Julian Slade. So I walked down the aisle in my kilt and went and introduced myself. And he was terribly nice to me. And instead of just giving me a, a signature, um, an autograph, he said, would I like to go back? stage I said yes I would and so I, he took me on stage and I saw how the magic flying saucer worked and the scenery and, and this was this I was eight eight literally on my eighth birthday and I looked up and I went this is what I do when I grow up and within about four months I'd worked out that the role I wanted to do was called a producer not as somebody suggested to me an impresario because I remember very cheekily at the age of nine saying impresarios put other people's shows on I want to put on my own Wow. And so I have. <laughs> but what a journey. What a journey. Not only putting on all those shows you've just seen, but also restoring and owning the theatres. I remember you saying that you swept the stage as your first job and now you own the theatre. Yes, my first sweeping job uh, and also cleaning up in, in, the, in the bar was at Drury Lane on the original production of Camelot. And three or four months later, uh, I heard there was a tour of Oliver going on. And I went down to, and talked my way into getting an acting ASM job. Uh, I didn't realise what it meant. <laughs> but on the first day of rehearsal, I had to actually sing in front of the company. And I enjoy, as well as move the show around on st off stage, I had to actually be part of the company on stage. So oh, wow. I spent a year touring. Now, I could barely sing. I could move very badly. Um, but I had the best time. And, and actually being in a great musical like that uh, was just an extraordinary experience. And on the first night in Manchester, I, I met the great Lionel Bart. Oh, God. He said, Lionel went, hello. How are you? How are you, my son? And they said, what are you going to do in the, when you grow up? And I went, oh, Mr. Bart, I want to put on musicals like this, great musicals like this. And who knew that not only would I end up owning all Lionel Bart's rights, because yeah. he sold them, but I now own the theatre where that show was first put on. And another seven theatres as well. And I know. The book, but they are lovely theatres. They're, well, the they're is, wonderful buildings. The book's called Master of the House. And what, you see, not only your theatres, but you see the glorious changes you've wrought in those theatres. You see theatres empty, which we don't normally see, 
and they are so beautiful. And you make that point in this book that architecture was your other interest. Yeah. And this really points up the beauty of these London mm. theatres. And the cleverness of the design. I mean, it's not a coincidence that five of the theatres I own were written, were built by Sprague, who was an absolutely genius. He was an Australian who came to London. And, and of course, I've got the great Matcham Theatre as well. Yes, Frank Victoria Matcham, Palace. Yeah. But what is, I think, special... I, I didn't write the book. Michael Coney wrote Michael Coney, Coney, done the who, Michael Coney yeah, you, is a you wonderful wrote the critic. <laughs> but I did. But what's marvellous about the book is that Michael Coney, who is a very long esteemed critic mm. has seen a lot of the productions and he's seen all of my productions of my life so he he's actually put my theatres into the his history mm. of the whole British theatre and you can see how, how extraordinary the West End has first of all been created and why it's survived so brilliantly to this yeah. day but you are a great risk taker I mean look at Les Mis which had pretty awful reviews when it came on but you had confidence in it you, you put your money where your mouth was. You put everything there really into that. And then word of mouth said, you've got to see this. Look at Les Mis. How long has it been running now? Well, it's just, it's in its 38th year. I'm planning its 40th anniversary at the moment. Yeah. Uh, I've just opened it in, again in America and in, in uh, it's going, you know, it carries on. But that is an extraordinary piece mm. as much because of Victor Hugo. I mean, I do believe, you know, I've got no favourites among my, my great musicals, but... The thing that I think no other musical has is a stronger book. I mean, Victor Hugo's novel is one of the great masterpieces of literature of all time, and he, the characters he wrote about are still there today. It's, I mean, who could have thought that the anthems that Claude Michel Schoenberg wrote are now actually the, the, the cries for people a, across the world fighting for their political life? Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the first shows that is going to be put back in Ukraine. They've been regularly contacted. That's the show they want to reopen the theatre yeah. when finally they get through the terrible time they're getting at the moment. And, and you understand why, because it is, it's a timeless piece and the characters are timeless. <laughs> You're very careful, though, with your entertainments, and broad as they are, not to preach. Entertainment is at the bottom of them, clearly, because you give the audience a good time. You don't tub thump, it seems to me. That's a case where a strong show had a strong message, but the show was the thing. What, when you're looking for new things or commissioning new things, what is it that gets your juices flowing? What makes you think, yes, I want to put myself behind this? Well, to be honest, I hardly ever commission material. I think the one thing that links all the shows of my career over the last 50 years or more is that nearly everything I've done, whether they've worked or not, are based on great classics source material, whether it be Bernard Shaw, whether it be Victor Hugo, whether it be Dickens, whether it be Pamela Travers, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be Louis Jordan. I mean, they're all the greatest of it. So, in fact, the shows that I do actually had that within them. It's not me saying, I'm going to... I'm looking for a, per, a, a particular story. Yeah. The stories leap up to me and I go, that's interesting. That's a story I would like to work on. Those are characters that I'd like to live on. As a producer, you then hand over that dream, if you like, to a director, to a choreographer, to uh, cast members. Are you having to make you think that I'm going to say hand over anything? <laughs> Well, I, the, there comes a point where I need them because I can't <laughs> choreograph. But believe me, you I, are I, very hands-on. I am totally hands-on, and I hand it over when I've created it with the authors. Yeah, and at that point, then they absolutely need to get it up there. But then I dive back in. So you're hard to, bring to work for. Oh, yes, I'm afraid there's, there's not a crotchet left undone. I mean, even if I'm doing a band call, I'll I'll dive in with the, my music, wonderful musical team to help create the right orchestration. But you're working with people, but tell us about what they do, who are very sensitive. I know. <laughs> and luckily, most of them still work with me after all these years. <laughs> but it is a teamwork. It is utterly teamwork. I think the people that have known me, you know, and continue to work with me, they know that all I'm interested in is not getting my own way. I'm, in, I'm interested in getting the right solution yeah. for the piece. That's What's the best that. moment for you? When, when is that, that special moment where you think, this is why I do this? But there's two moments. There's the moment you finish the final draft and hand it to the actors. Then there's the dreadful time whilst the actors stumble through it and then come back and create something that you never dreamt of 
far better than you did. And then when you see that, and then you see that work in front of an audience, uh, you see your child grow up. Do you like first nights? Not really. No. I, I mean, I drink through first nights. <laughs> I like them. Uh, you know, I have drink all over the place. <laughs> and I go in and out. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I sort of know if by the reaction that it's going that well. But, you know, there's nothing one can do. And it's a great, and if it's, if it's all joyous, then it's lovely to see, see it for yeah. half an hour or ten minutes. And, but on the whole, I don't. Um, I, I, at, at that point, it belongs to the public. And is there always something else cooking up there? Are you now looking for the next thing? Hamilton, of course, huge, again, completely different to anything else you've done. Um, huge success. But are you now casting around yourself? Well, no, I mean, there is one more show that I'm, I'm doing, which was one of my COVID shows, uh, which we're just doing for the BBC, called Old Friends. I, I did a huge gala with Judy Dench and, and Damien Lewis and Noel de Staunton. It was huge. It was a sensational... Anne Reid saw it. She was you? there. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, well, it was... The thing is, I've just completed it yeah. uh, for the BBC. It's going out at Christmas. But it actually started when Stephen Sondheim, the wonderful composer lyricist and I were chatting during Covid and he said Cam it's time we did a third show and so it was the start of it then but sadly he didn't live to see it and I completed it just after his death um, at the end of last year through Christmas and we put it on but actually I believe like side by side the first show I did with him and Julie McKenzie all those years ago it, it's a terrific show so I'm going to be doing that in next year but the thing is you know you've just shown lovely selection of clips of my shows they're all going like a train i mean seeing the reaction of the audience is as if it's a first night yeah. and i think when i i remember when i was 16 i was taken to see the last night of my finale a show i absolutely adore and i had seen it for the third time and i'd realized then actually that it wasn't quite as good as the first time I'd seen it with Julie Andrews and Rex Harrison, and it had progressively gone downhill a bit. And I vowed there and then that if I ever was going to be a successful producer, I would make sure that my shows are as great ten years in, mm. please God I haven't run that long, as they were on the first night. And I think that's the reason my shows have run so long everywhere in the world. But I have about 30 to 40 productions like that all, 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 yeah. all the way around the world at the time, so there's not an awful lot of time to come up with new stuff. There is time, though, to uh, switch off when you get home to Stavardale Priory or Glorious Garden with yes. your partner, Michael, who's a great gardener, Michael of Portrench. Uh, we meet quite regularly. And you farm there. We do. How much livestock have you got? Well, I've got my own flock of Welsh black, yeah. mountain sheep, absolutely delicious. I'll give you a leg soon. <laughs> and uh, we've got... There's an offer. <laughs> <laughs> we've got alpacas. We've got our own chickens. Uh, I used to... Rear turkeys, but oh my god, it was a lot of oh. it's a lot of um, problems. And oh, with the this year, this year yeah. uh, maybe I needed to this year, but <laughs> hopefully I've got one in the deep freeze somewhere. Is um, it a good switch off out there in the country? It's, I, I live in the country, yeah. really, and come to London. I really, I'm, I'm a country boy by heart. You know, I've always liked that, and I was brought up in in Hertfordshire, uh, and of course I went to school in Bath, um, and so I feel I always felt a West Country man. Yeah. You know, so I love being there. I love going to see my friends in London, but real world is in the country and, of course, the west coast of Scotland where I've been going there since I was six. So uh, I'm very lucky to have a foot in both camps. Now you'll step in some light refreshment, I I will. Time for today's Ode to Joy.
was Winter Wonderland in Scotland, courtesy of Lyle McAlmont and set to Furry Lees by Beethoven. Coming up, I don't know about you, Cameron, but uh, I think I'm ready for a Christmas tipple. Do you care to join me? Oh, I think so. We'll do that. We'll see you with Cameron and the tipples very shortly. <laughs>